I see that uh, most of our guests have uh, had a chance to pick up uh, lunch and, and get back to their tables. So I'd like to begin uh, our luncheon section uh, of the program today by uh, reintroducing our moderator, Joanna Mendelson Foreman, Senior Associate at CSIS in the Americas program. And we have a special speaker, the Executive Vice President of the Inter-American Development Bank and Manager of the Multilateral Investment Fund. Joanna, would you do the honors? Thank you, Steve. Now that we can recover from making all those sandwiches uh, for the guests, we can go back to our business <laughs> of working. But um, it is a really great honor for me to introduce Julie T. Katzman, who, as Steve has just told you, is the Executive Vice President of the Inter-American Development Bank. But she also runs something that I think people don't know about as well, which is the Multilateral Investment Fund, which for many people don't really even understand that it is one of the grant-making mechanisms of the Inter-American Development Bank that has done so much good around the Americas for supporting uh, new innovative projects. Uh, but I have to tell you, I, I mean, this is a girls club and I want to say that I admire women who do great things. And uh, Julie Katzman is one of them. I mean, she's had a distinguished career. You can read her lengthy bio and I'm not going to do it and be very Latina and go word by word. But she has an extraordinary experience in finance, in development, and also as a public figure here in Washington of doing good for the right things. And I actually saw Julie in action last year at the Haiti Donors Conference, which was a feeding frenzy at the UN with all the typical accoutrements. But Julie was the one, I could see this one woman managing the hordes of people who were coming over, the supplicants looking for grants, in the most appropriate way, but also doing it in a way which really provided information and insight into a very confusing process where everybody was trying to figure out how to build back better but not understanding the processes. So um, I was impressed, and as a New Yorker, that takes a lot to always impress a New Yorker, but I thought this would be the person, when we ran a Haiti conference, that I wanted as the speaker. And in fact, her boss, uh, President Luis Moreno of the IDB, when I approached him at the uh, special session a few weeks ago at the UN on uh, Haiti, that was run by our colleagues in the Colombian government, when they, since they're chair of the Security Council for another two days, and he said to me, no, you need Julie Katzman here. So, of course, of course, I picked up the phone and that's history. But I want you to really pay attention to the kinds of things that you, you, she has to offer us because if we're looking at moving forward, the IDB is going to be the institution with the Haitian people that really helps advance that agenda of building back better. So thank you, Julie, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Joanna. And as, as those who know her will know that she, there was a little bit of overstatement there. So, uh, and Anne, you also know that you can't ever say no to a New Yorker either. So here I am and, and pleased to be here. And I, I brought a little bit of PowerPoint because I felt if I had to compete with sandwiches, then we should have a little bit of a visual aid. So that's why we have that here. Um, today, as you can see, the topic is, can the private sector rebuild Haiti? And I want to take you back for a moment to October 2009. On October 1st and 2nd of 2009, the IDB, together with the Office of the Special Envoy, participated and organized in a, an investment conference in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince. It was the largest business meeting in the history of Haiti. And you're seeing the logos of the companies that participated in that meeting. There were 443 private companies who participated over 300 of which were from outside Haiti, and the largest contingent was from the United States, and that was over 100 companies out of the 694 overall participants. They represented many sectors. I mean, there were agriculture people there, renewable energy people there, garment sector people there, telecom, financial services, you, as you can see. And all of these companies, okay, overstatement, many of these companies were in the midst of formulating concrete investments in Haiti when the earthquake struck. So can the private sector rebuild Haiti? Most certainly yes. But will the private sector rebuild Haiti? That's a much more complicated question and answer. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So let's take a quick look at a snapshot of some of the macro statistics around Haiti today. And, we, and we've, 
We've put a comparison with Nicaragua because Nicaragua is a country with a GDP of approximately the same as Haiti's, about six and a half billion dollars, although it only has about 60 percent of the population. And a few things on the chart will jump out at you, and they are conveniently highlighted in gray, so you can follow along. The level of informality. The level of informality in Haiti is about 95 percent. And that compares to about 58% in Nicaragua and about 50% for the region as a whole. The GDP per capita is about one third of that of Nicaragua's. The level of loans in the formal banking sector, which total about $800 million, that's the level of loans in Nicaragua are about two and a half times that. And if you go to the micro enterprise sector, the microfinance in portfolio in Nicaragua is also about twice that of Haiti's. So what do these data points begin to tell us? We think that that gives you a sense of the business environment as a whole has many obstacles that have to be addressed. And in particular, when you look at this, it's a guidepost to the fact that there's a missing middle, that there's a lack of small and medium-sized enterprises, which we all know are the enterprises that fuel economic growth in any vibrant functioning economy. And this is where we at the IDP start, so that, yes, the private sector can rebuild Haiti. So what are the three challenges on which we're focusing? Improving the business environment, addressing market failures that are imp impeding the growth of those very SMEs and the linkages along value chains, and last, the decentralization of economic development outside of Port-au-Prince. In improving the business environment, we're taking a very pragmatic approach with the government, focusing on things that make a big difference and that we saw could get done relatively quickly and have a tangible effect on something that people look at when they think about doing business in a country, the doing business report. So we've focused on two indicators, first of all, which is starting a new business and getting a construction permit. So the bad news is on the right-hand side of the page. Today, it takes 1,100 days to start a new business. And it takes 180 days to get a construction permit. So the goal of what we're doing is to reduce that 1,100 days to what is seen generally around the region, 10. And to reduce that 180 days to 60 days for a construction permit. Interestingly, these are two indicators that Kazakhstan focused on for much the same reason. If you can affect these two indicators and bring yourself into compliance, you can jump many, many spaces on the doing business indicator, and that's what you see here on the right. If we're able to do this, Haiti will move from 151st to 121st, and that's a big difference out of 183 countries. Now, what does it take to do that? Well, it's the costs and the number of steps and how you do this is extremely well laid out and we've done the work in Haiti as well to lay it out. The financial resources to implement this are already there in projects that we have on the ground today. But it does take some legislative change or a decree from President Preval before he leaves office. And that's obviously the government's part in all of this. The business environment cannot fix itself. These and these other challenges on property rights, credit information, the use of collateral and enforceability are all going to be extremely critical to the private sector's ability to make things work for them in Haiti. And it means that we need the government to help facilitate these changes. These reforms have been done by many other countries. We've, we've done them throughout the region. The, the processes we've come up with in Haiti are modeled on those reforms, but it will take some political will to make that happen. Next. Let's move on to the developing, development of the missing middle and critical value chain linkages. You can see on this slide what the issues are for doing business in Haiti. A lack of skilled labor, which is complicated by the tremendous brain drain in Haiti. Did you know that Haiti is the largest exporter of skilled workers in the world, taking into account the size of their population? I mean, that's just a, it's a shocking thing. You saw the size of the country's loan portfolio. So it's not surprising that access to credit is a real problem, and only 20% of SMEs actually have access to credit in Haiti. And when they do have access to loans, they're very short-term and very expensive. And the earthquake wiped out the already poorly capitalized companies for, for many SMEs. 
Medium-sized companies lost about 20% of their capital base, and micro-enterprises lost about 40% of their capital base. So we've proposed a number of approaches to address these market failures. The first is called Productive Haiti, and it's targeted at strengthening SMEs. The second is focused on strengthening value chains, and the last is working to establish new SMEs in new geographies. You can see here what we've developed. A number of ways to strengthen SMEs, from a partial guarantee credit fund that's already up and running, to a social investment fund that will be launched shortly, to business development services. But rather than talk about all of this in the abstract, let me use an example and talk about Joelle. Joelle lives in Port-au-Prince, and she's heard that there's a school that's going to be rebuilt in her neighborhood. And she has a background in construction. So she thinks, OK, I want to participate in that and, and, and be a subcontractor. Well, that's great, but to do that, she's got to have a cement mixer, she's got to have hard hats, she's got to have shovels, she's got to have skilled workers. So how does she go about getting these capital goods? She goes to the social investment fund to get a loan. It turns out she's not quite prepared to have a loan. So the social investment fund refers her to the business development services arm. The business development service arm helps her develop her business plan, they provide her with some coaching and training for her managerial capabilities. And at the end of all this, she ends up with a bankable project. So she can go back to the social investment fund, get a loan, and get a loan at a reasonable rate with a reasonable tenure. OK, so now she has to upgrade her workforce, because the work that's going to be done has to be anti-seismic, and it has to meet standards. And so her workforce needs more training than has typically been available. So the training facility helps her with training. She takes the 50% of the cost that she has to pay for those training services that was in her business plan and participates to get her workers up and running. And now having done that, she can participate in the work rebuilding the school. And it goes really well. And now she knows that because of the education fund, there are three more schools in the neighborhood in her area that are being rebuilt and she wants to participate and it requires another cement mixer. So she goes back to the social investment fund and they say, well, that's great, except for one thing. Your balance sheet can't take any more debt, so we can't give you a loan. So she goes to the quasi-equity fund. And the quasi-equity fund partners with her, invests in her company for a reasonable rate of return, and she gets that cement mixer. And now she's gone from being a small enterprise to a medium-sized enterprise. And we do this over and over and over again. And we attract more capital to those two key funds, the quasi-equity fund and the social investment fund. And we start to chip away, and we start to build a middle class. And those are the tools that we're putting in place, capitalized by the IDB, capitalized by the Spanish uh, Development Authority, which has contributed 50 million euros to the social investment fund, and the private sector as well, to begin to be able to build these kinds of businesses. Similarly, let's turn to the famous Haitian mangoes. Some of you have probably noticed when you've gone to Whole Foods and Walmart and other places that there's an Odwalla smoothie called Mango Tango. And in the, I have a right and left problem. Oh no, it's in the center now. <laughs> in the center of the label, it says Haiti Hope. And 10 cents of every purchase goes toward a project that we're doing with the Coca-Cola company and a number of other partners like USAID and the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund and the Soros Development Fund to work with 25,000 mango growers. The project is a model for the same kinds of systemic fixes that can improve the profitability, the productivity, and the incomes of mango growers and mango participants all across the value chain. And it's a model for the same kind of thing that can be done with cacao, it can be done with coffee, it can be done with bamboo, and we have plans to do it in all of those areas. So what are we doing? We're fixing the linkages that are broken. We're addressing low productivity by integrating producers into producer business groups and using those groups as agents of change from everything for changing the way growers prune their trees to the age of the tree stock that's out there, to the timing for picking mangoes, the way they pick mangoes, the way they box mangoes. All of these things will increase the number of mangoes that are available for export. So today, when you buy that Adwala Mango Tango, yes, 10 cents is going to Haiti, 
but the mangoes inside the bottle are actually from Mexico because there aren't enough Haitian mangoes to be able to make that juice. The second thing we're doing is decreasing intermediation and export costs, which eat the growers up alive. And the third is fostering the growth of local processing capability. Whether that's juice, whether that's dried mangoes or other capabilities, that's the final stage in all of this. And it's actually interesting. Coca-Cola has been a great partner in this project, and, and they've devoted sub very substantial management resources. It turns out that the primary species of mango in Haiti is not a great juice mango. And it's harder than you think to figure out this species stuff. And I'm, I'm really bad in biology, so I just listen. But they've been actually looking at all the different varieties of mangoes grown in Haiti, turning them into juice, and flying them around the world to Coca-Cola's labs to look at how to optimize the juice that can come from Haitian mangoes so that when we get the production rolling, we can actually start building the right kind of mango to make juice. The results. By 2015, we expect to double the incomes of 25,000 mango growers, create 500 additional formal jobs in the sectors, and increase the participation of women in the productive growers associations by 20%. And that is a really important goal of this project and a really important part societally of the change that we hope to, to, to foment through these value chain projects. So third thing, well, what I described with Joelle in Port-au-Prince works really well in Port-au-Prince, but it doesn't work that well elsewhere in the country where there's a less developed spirit of entrepreneurship and less, less developed business environment. So to, do, to release that entrepreneurial spirit and let's say find the next Joelle's elsewhere in the country, we've developed another mechanism and it's an accelerator and an incubator. And again, I'll use an example. We're leveraging off some work that we did with business plan competitions already in Haiti, which have been actually very successful. So let's say we run a call for proposals and that's basically how this all starts. And we get about 300 submissions. Odds are that in that 300 submissions, about 50 of them will actually be already up and running small enterprises that we can uh, gear toward productive Haiti and find resources for them in that arena. So now we have about 100, uh, I'm sorry, we have, how many did we start with? We have about 250 left. So let's say another 100 of them are eliminated for lack of substance or the ideas just are not that good. So now we've got 150 left, and we look at that 150, and we invest some resources to figure out where there are overlaps and redundancies, and we consolidate some of those proposals, and we get to 70. And we look at those 70, and we invest a few months of work in the incubator, trying to sort out where the winners are. And probably over a three or four month period of time, that will boil itself down to about 35 businesses. And those 35 businesses will get very intensive help over a period of 18 months. And at the end of that 18 months, based on our experience, we think there'll be about 20 businesses that will now be established small businesses and ready to start to run on their own. They'll continue to get support, but of a much less intensive nature. So over an 18 month period, we'll have gone from zero to 70 with the 50 that have gone to Productive Haiti and the 20 new enterprises, which is a pretty, a pretty good thing to do in a relatively short period of time. And with the right resources and that kind of track record, we, be able, we believe we'll be able to use this not only, say, in the north, which is one of the areas we're focusing on, but in the other poles that are part of the decentralization effort. So now let's turn to the last point, which is regional economic imbalances. 80% of the country's economic activity takes place in Port-au-Prince, but that only represents about 40% of the population. So clearly, if you're going to have balanced, robust economic growth, you have to be able to do this outside Port-au-Prince. The government set uh, uh, an, ex an expectation and an idea of three other poles, and the IDB has taken a lead role in the North Pole, together with the US government, the EU, certain private donors. And the North Pole is a great pole to be focused on because it's got some wonderful things going for it, and the first is tourism. Now, I don't know how many of you would ha and have been to this part of Haiti, but that picture on the left, if you weren't here at a Haiti meeting, I would hazard a guess that if I had just shown you this picture blindly, you would think, oh, I don't know, Switzerland, Bhutan, somewhere with mountains and castles, right? 
but it's Haiti, and that's the Citadel. And the shame is, let me do a show of hands. How many people here have seen, have gone to the Citadel? Okay, so see, this is a, this is a very atypical group, and it's maybe, maybe 15% of the people in the room. And yet everybody here is really passionate about Haiti, right? So the tourist resources in the north are, are outstanding and world class. And we'll show you a couple others. That's the Palais. And the next is what brings 600,000 people to Haiti every year on Royal Caribbean cruise lines. So <coughs> tourism is and can be a huge driver of private sector development in the north and is one of the things on which we're focusing. Agriculture is the second. And the north has great advantages in agriculture. It has multiple microclimates. It has actually very fertile soil. It has experienced growers across a lot of different crops. And it's got very easy access to the DR and other export markets in the Caribbean, which don't grow much of their own produce. So agriculture done well is a, a great development opportunity for the private sector. And last, let's talk about garments. And the North brings not only the advantage that the whole country has, which is the HOPE II Act, but it brings access to a port and proximity to markets. My colleague, Agustina Gary, will talk in greater depth in one of the panels this afternoon about specifically the industrial park in the North. So I'm going to give the 40 or 50 even thousand foot um, approach here. But over a billion dollars is being invested by the Haitian government and by private donors. And interestingly, the first occupants of that industrial park are people, are the companies that participated in that s seminar and meeting in October 2009. The industrial park itself will create over 30,000 direct garment jobs. Now that compares to somewhere around 15,000 today. And it will create another 50,000 indirect jobs associated with it. And on the tourism and agriculture sides, there are another 50,000 private sector jobs that will be created in those two areas. So that's about 120,000 private sector jobs over approximately a three to five year period of time. And it's worth saying that there are numerous ways to go about building these jobs, from the traditional in the industrial park to some innovative socially focused models, one of which we're working with called Industrial Revolution II, which is a completely green, garment and handicraft factory complex that will share profits with its workers. It will provide healthcare, education, and other benefits, focusing on higher value added garments in Haiti. It's a terrific model and one that we hope will be able to populate elsewhere. So what does all of this amount to? First, as you can tell from everything that I've said, this requires a lot of effort from the government from the private sector, from all parties, to achieve the reforms and actions that are needed to create a credible platform for all this development. But with this work, the Presidential Commission on Competitiveness, which worked together with AID, OTF, the Haitian private sector, the development community writ large, has projected this can amount to over a million jobs, or just under a million jobs, actually, in just the five key sectors. And this is against a, a country today with two and a half or three million jobs. So, so what do we take away from all of this? Well, to my mind, this is definitely evidence that the private sector can rebuild Haiti. And that it's in all of our interests for the private sector to rebuild Haiti. And that we have an obligation to help the private sector to rebuild Haiti and make it happen. So I didn't want to take up too much time because I heard there was a need to, to, a desire to have some questions and hear a little bit more in detail about what the IDB is doing on all of these, um, these initiatives and others. But hopefully that will have given you uh, a sense of why we think and are committed to very strongly facilitating the kind of environment that can make it true that yes, the private sector can rebuild Haiti. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Not only did we have a great presentation, but I think I came away with a very hopeful 
uh, impression. And I think just in fairness, when Steve Johnson and myself were talking about this conference, I think the most important vision, and also our colleagues with the NED who do all this great governance work, is we wanted to show that there is a glass half full. And I think your presentation certainly conveys that in the panels before and that follow want to do it. But I know that many people have come in here to ask questions because this is still a vision. It's a vision and a hopeful one. But we'd like to have you share your questions with uh, Julie Katzman so she can respond or refer them to the right people at the bank. Thank you. And let me just ask my, my colleague, Agustina Guerri, to come up as well and introduce uh, Ma Maria Teresa Villanueva, who is at the Multilateral Investment Fund and is responsible for the MIFs activities in Haiti, and Agustina Guerre, who is on one of the future panels and will no doubt be introduced in more detail, but is the head of the Haiti group at the bank. Um, after the earthquake, we created a presence in Washington that has um, seven, I think, full-time people run by Agustin as well as reinforcing our office in Haiti, which now has 50 full-time professionals um, in, in the Port-au-Prince office. Yes, thank you so much. My name is Elise Young with Action Aid. And uh, Michel Martelly, when he was in, in the U.S. last week, talked about how um, Haiti was going to be taking the lead from IDB on some land reform initiatives or proposals. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, how far along is that? And, and what do those plans look like at this moment? I think uh, let's take uh, two or three questions because I saw a lot of hands and I want to be fair to everybody. Um, Melanie? Thank you. I'm Melanie Oliviero with DAI Development Alternatives, Inc. And I was delighted to hear, Julie, as you worked your way through this presentation, that you really captured how you can integrate formal and informal economies and how you can make those linkages between some of these very large, exciting, attractive, industrially focused, export market oriented with the reality that most people on the ground are still going to be very much at a micro or a small business. But the more that we can link them, and so my question is, can, is, is that really a piece of, of what you're learning and applying now that you can template and put into more sectors that you can share with the other donors who were here and had projects that have the danger of being <coughs> an opportunity, a project, and then they perish because they're one off? Thanks. Thank you. We'll take one more question. And that gentleman um, with the gray tires or the striped tires, sir, I think I'm the third table down. Yes. Uh, Robert Nicholas with the AME Church's Service and Development Agency. In your last slide, I believe you showed animal husbandry at about 400,000 jobs. I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit and uh, is it looking at this model that you gave on the mangoes, or is it similar in the approach that would be taken in that sector also? Thank you. Okay, I think we'll give our speaker a break and let her respond to some of these questions. Um, I'll start on some of them, and then I'll also uh, ask Augustine and, and, and Maite to fill in the blanks. Um, land reform. Land reform is a really complicated, as everybody knows, complicated uh, subject. Um, we actually are not in the lead in, in pieces of it, and we are in the lead in others. And um, the, the rural and the urban are somewhat separated. The French Development Agency is working very closely with us. I, I, I think the sense of your question was whether the Haitian government wants to take the lead on that as opposed to the IDB. I, I, I lost that a little bit. Was that? part of what you were asking, or were you asking about what we're I, doing? I think just what the IDB okay. is doing, what contributions they're making, what section, and, and what the plan looks like for the okay. IDB so far. Let me hand to Augustine for some of the details. Yes. As, as, as Julie said, well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'd love to be a part of this girls' club. <laughs> Land reform. Fully endorsed. It's on an honorary basis. <laughs> yes. 
It's a very, very tough issue, both in the urban side and in the, and, and in the rural areas. <clears throat> and we see uh, the, the, the drama of this in many of the projects in which we are involved. We see it with our housing project, where we cannot start construction even after having hired a constructor, uh, because the land that, where we've been shown titles of public ownership turn out to be private in the end, and we cannot start. And we see it in the rural areas where uh, um, micro farmers with one hectare cannot get access to credit because they cannot show uh, a title as a, as a guarantee. The bank is focused given that one of our, the pillars in our strategy is the agriculture program. The bank is focused in uh, land titling in the rural areas. As Julie was mentioned, mentioning, the French Development Agency and the OAS are working or are starting to work in the urban areas. And of course, there are many points of, of contact because many of the agencies are, are, are the same. We are preparing a first operation, a pilot operation, $27 million operation that will be taken to the board in the next couple of months with a land titling project that will give titles to 15 thousand farmers focused in the north of the country, even though there will be institutional arrangements that are cross-cutting. Um, this is a very complicated uh, uh, environment for, for many reasons. First, institutional. There are no registries, and what there existed disappeared with the earthquake. The institutionality is broken down into many different parts. You have parts that are within the government, parts that are within local authorities, and then you have the uh, association of, um, how do you say, notaries, <coughs> and the association of topographers <laughs> that also play a role in all this complicated equation. And then you have a lack of history because Someone occupied a land, a piece of land, uh, 70 years ago. His kids were there but never got a title. And there's no history to record who was there when, and no history, as, and, and no tradition as to how to acknowledge that someone is really the owner after saying he has been there for four generations. So it's a very complicated process. That's why we're starting with a pilot program. It's an expensive pilot program because uh, uh, almost $30 million just to see what we learn and then try to replicate uh, is an, definitely an expensive program. But we think uh, uh, we need to start. There is a commitment from these authorities, and it's one of the issues that we've mentioned with President Martelly, and uh, um, his closest advisors are deeply involved in this, and, and, and a couple of high-ranking figures in his administration will be strongly committed to this program. So we'll see how it goes. It should be starting uh, in the second semester this year, and we are uh, um, optimistic that this will create momentum and, and, and move forward. Great, so the second question, which was about uh, formal and informal and linkages and, right, so, so first, clearly, in Haiti, the micro side of enterprise is incredibly important. Um, that when you look at the numbers of where production is coming from and where business activity is coming from, it's, it is heavily weighted on the micro side. And we um, combined, the IDB and, and primarily the Multilateral Investment Fund, have been very active in the microfinance sector in Haiti to begin with. And, and shortly after the earthquake, basically set up a facility together with some other donors to recapitalize the microfinance institutions. Uh, basically, the entire equity base of the microfinance sector was destroyed in the earthquake. Um, so so that's, that's one piece of this. And then you need some more tools. So we've done um, a number of things to institutionalize the, the linking of microenterprises to these various value chains. And, and that's the case in agriculture, it's the case in recycling, it's the case in garment, because we really do see that that is, as you said, critical if everybody is going to be able to move from one stage to another. Um, 
there's also then the question of how do you grow those microenterprises? Because linking and staying stagnant just isn't enough, right? So we've been working on some of the things that are here and other things as well. So for example, we, we think it's really important to have a bank that is beyond microfinance and really starts to focus on small enterprise. We've had, we had um, a series of conversations with BRAC, actually, which we were very hopeful about. But as it turns out, BRAC has a few things on their plate right now. Mm -hmm. And um, this was not the exact moment for them to actually establish a BRAC brand um, in Haiti. However, they're going to continue to work with us and others and, and bring some lessons learned into um, the sector. There are, there are a couple of other institutions that we're planning to work with so that we can begin to provide some of that, you know, sort of in between that micro to small bridge kind of financing, which is below part of what was outlined there. And then um, the question that you asked, which is also critical about templating, as you, as you put it. So the work that we're doing in, in um, Haiti Hope is very much in concert with the Department of Agriculture, the Secretary of Agriculture, because that work in cacao and in coffee and in bamboo and across all of this and in the, on the animal husbandry side, it needs to be replicable. And so while this is, uh, does not have the government of Haiti's money directly in it, it's working together with the agricultural ministry in, in um, complementary programs so that they're a part of this and they're seeing how this is working and will be part of the arm to replicate this, in fact. And, and, and it also, I should say, the, the MIF has a very big focus on how to communicate what it is doing. And the ability to work with and communicate with other donors is implicit in this. And, and AID is in this as well, and we'll come together to, to help do that. Um, on the animal husbandry question, I am going to hand to Maite. Yeah, um, there are uh, many opportunities to create jobs, most of them informal because of the sector. But we have been working so far uh, in initiatives, and we are looking at different initiatives, especially in the, uh, in the cattle industry. We've been working with cooperatives and NGOs like Veterimed in order to analyze their associative models, because uh, in, in these businesses, association is something very, very important. And teaching the associations how to work as a business, not as a social entity, is also a very important challenge. And we have identified in Haiti models that can be analyzed and replicated. And that's something that is the, the work of the MIF. We, we don't have many, a lot of resources. So what we do is we try to analyze models to see what is working and then find partners to implement and bring these models to scale. So that's what we are doing with the husbandry sector. And um, we, uh, we also uh, are looking at models in the poultry, in the poultry and in the fishery, uh, especially the tilapia business. We've seen that most of the seafood that is uh, consumed in Haiti is imported. And there is a huge capacity to develop that industry as well. Thanks. And I think Alison would like to add something. <laughs> because I think you, you, you frame that, that second question very well. There is big projects, big ideas, and then there's the reality. And the reality is that work in Haiti demands something extra, because it's not getting things, improving the way things are working, it's just creating new things that are not there. There's no middle class in Haiti. If you imagine a, a pyramid, there is a, a group of big, powerful firms belonging to the 10 or 20 traditional families. Then there is a very broad base of very, very poor people that are reasonably well served with microfinance. And then there is this huge gap, which is more than the middle, which covers almost to the tip and almost to the bottom, of informal, non-existing entities that today have a great opportunity because the, the amount of money that's flowing into Haiti for many different projects, and Julie was putting the example of, of Joel, just imagine only to build, to rebuild the schools, the education program in Haiti is around $1 billion for infrastructure. Who's, nobody's going to come from uh, far away to build tiny little schools. That will be done by Haitians. So there's a big opportunities for new Joels to, 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 to come into this, into this business. But Joel needs all those things that uh, uh, Julie was mentioning. And, and, and then there's 
So what's going on? With amazing generosity from the government of Spain, we put together this SIF, the Social Investment Fund. They contributed 50 million euros. It's not a grant. We don't want to grant money to the private sector. It's a loan with no interest. We will have to recover 50 million, to repay 50 million euros after 12 years. We don't want to establish a new bank. The financial system exists. There are good financial institutions. We don't want to compete. We wouldn't be able to compete. And we don't want to have 100 financial or operational officers there. We want to work together, co-financing and sharing the risk with existing financial sector. And they will lend at their very expensive rates, probably 30% and two-year tenors. And the SIF will put in money at a reasonable somewhere around 10, 12 percent. Two from, two from the SIF, one from the financial sector. All in all, the rate should come under 20. And that makes all these new businesses start to look like feasible. Are they feasible? No, they're not, for the reasons Julie explained. Because Joel uh, uh, will need to buy a new equipment, but to buy new equipment, she will have to have a, a program uh, that will help us. That's grant money, technical uh, uh, cooperation to formalize her little firm, to teach her managerial capacity, and to prepare a bankable project to present to the SIF plus financial sector uh, uh, bank or, 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 or fund. And then there's a trading facility, and then there's quasi-equity facility. And where there are no little companies, then there's the incubator model there. So, so I think that where is that now? The, the, Spa the Spanish have approved the $50 million. The IIC, another of the branches of the, of, the, of the bank, will be the fund manager. They are starting to operate in Port-au-Prince, hopefully around July, August of this, of this year. There are people being transferred there to deal with that. There are linkages with the existing financial system being developed right now. We are extremely optimistic about this. The bank is covering many different projects, but to be honest, Roads, they will take one year more, one year less. They will cost one million more, one million less, but they will be done. The energy sector, it's a tough reform, but it will be done. Water and sanitation, the same. The two big challenges that will make Haiti different this time is the education program and the development of the private sector program. And that's where most of our people and most of the contacts with the rest of the international community, one of the other good things which Cheryl mentioned this morning, is that there is no competing international organizations here. Because, to be honest, the bank is granting $200 million, $200 million a year to Haiti. If we do things very, 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 very well, we will grant $200 million a year. If we do things very, very, very badly, we will grant $200 million a year. So our challenge and the way which we will be measured is how many of those $200 million a year will become pupils in the classroom or will become people working that are not working today. And there it's, it's a, a fantastic way to join with the World Bank, with the USAID, and working together in developing these projects. Thank you. I, we're close to the end of our time, but I'd like to take one or two more questions so that we can not have people leave unhappy. Uh, there are some hands up in the back. Uh, would you please uh, ask your questions? and? Then we'll have uh, our panelists answer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Phil Oldham. I'm with Mercy Corps. And, and my question is, um, coming back to mangoes as a proxy for the agricultural sector, maybe, is that does Haiti need 25,000 mango farmers, each of whom have two to four trees? And if we double their income, is that going to move them up into that middle that you're referring to that's not there? And so while doubling the income of 25,000 farmers is great, is that really getting to the issue of, of creating a middle class and employment and, and transforming? And, and, and so is there a need to expand the agricultural sector by helping that many, or is it focusing? And it, and it does come back to the land tenure issue with regard to agriculture, but, but as I say, ultimately, do we need that many mango farmers in Haiti to begin with? Let's take one.
Thank you. Uh, Pablo Reyes from Salat in, uh, in, Col in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, it seems that uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, in every sense is coordination. Uh, and in particular to the work that you're doing, uh, to what extent are you going to be coordinating and, and linking the JOELs with the private sector? I mean, you, these are the companies you mentioned have been interested in Haiti for a while, but there are several new companies that are interested in participating in this process, both from their uh, economic interest, but also in terms of working with their, uh, within their social corporate responsibility uh, approach. Uh, so to what extent it will be possible to uh, go through the bank to establish that kind of, uh, of relations? And also in terms of the lessons learned that, uh, that you have taken, uh, that you have used for, for Haiti, and that uh, the lessons that you're learning, how this will be, be available uh, for uh, for uh, other disasters. Unfortunately, we have uh, uh, several of those in the region and throughout the world, but I think uh, uh, the lessons learned and the level of cooperation, it's an important issue, and, and I think the work that you're doing is uh, uh, could be uh, very important if you can take those lessons learned in both directions. Thank you. I think we'll let uh, Julie uh, have the last word, and Augustine, if you, or Maite, if you want to add in. Thank you. Those are great questions. So um, today there are just so <laughs> I think I might have left an incorrect impression. Um, there are 150,000 mango growers in Haiti today, right? So we're not expanding the number of mango growers. Um, most of those people don't derive 100% of their income from mangoes. So what this is focused on is improving their income from mangoes. Um, they do have very few trees per person. Um, in fact, they also have very old trees per person. So, so one of the things that's important in the linkage with the government is to create complementary resources for growing other kinds of crops while they can begin to refresh that tree stock. Um, I, I think it would be unrealistic, and the work that's being done actually in, in Tanzania and Kenya and Uganda also demonstrates this, that to, to think about changing the way you grow mangoes in this country from one to two mango trees or four mango trees per person to suddenly saying, okay, let's have, oops, let's have a plantation and grow mangoes. And they actually don't grow that well that way either, by the way. Um, there are some, but that's not the way people derive income today. And it's not likely that we're going to wholesale change the way mangoes are grown. So the question is, how do we improve the lives of those people so that they, A, do send their kids to school, uh, B, begin to have more income, and, and are able to begin to change their lives. You're right. They will not be the first members of the middle class. But, but they, they start to move. And you start to change the structure of society in really important ways when you start to change them being able to live in, and earn a, um, a reasonable living and, and one that has grace surrounded by it. Um, on the, the coordination challenge, and I'll start on this, and, and if Augustine wants to add, please do. Um, you know, uh, I think that Haiti is in many ways a model for how organizations can work together in the future. We, we talk, um, and Augustine, I'm stealing your line here, but many times in many countries, you talk about coordination, and it means you all go into a room together, and I tell you what you're doing, what I'm doing, you tell me what I'm doing, and then we walk out of the room, and we both keep doing our own thing. And you know, the the benefit I think of the moment in time of this tragedy happening when the financial crisis was up upon us meant that all of the donors insisted that there be a better use of their funds, a more coordinated use of their funds, and so the work done up front to say make sure that no, no major priority is left uncovered, but each of us has priorities, and then we're working collectively on things where they are shared priorities, is I think changing some of that. And, and I do believe that it will be a model that we can use elsewhere in the world. Um, and it's not easy, and old habits die hard, and some sectors happen sooner rather than others, and some institutions are earlier adapters than others. And, you know, I don't mind saying about our own institution every once in a while, you have to say to somebody, no, don't be happy about the fact that, you know, we're getting the headline and those guys aren't. That's not good, <laughs> um, because that's part of it, right? You have to be a good partner and you have to share the glory as well as the, the hard work. 
Um, so, but, but I do think there's a fundamental shift that has occurred as a, re as a resu result of this, and we're learning new, new habits. Um, sharing that information. You know, I've said a number of times that one of the things about the IDB, I I've only been in this job for a little while, and one of the things I noticed early on, particularly in places like Capitol Hill, is that the, the reputation of the IDB, I think, is well behind what the IDB is actually doing and accomplishing. And I think one of the reasons for that is the part of the question about how do you share what you're accomplishing. And Haiti, we're using as um, um, a, a first, uh, an early adapter of part of what we're doing on visualization and being able to share our results and our lessons in a way that more approaches the 21st century than the early 20th. Um, we have developed some, some tools with Microsoft that are going to allow each and every one of you to hop on your computer and see where we're working, what's happening where we're working, how we're allocating money, ultimately over time probably how other donors are allocating money, and the kinds of results that we're getting from those projects, and the kinds of lessons that we're learning along the way. And hopefully by the end of this year, that will be up and running. Um, it will for sure be version 1.0, and it will have to get to version 2.0, we hope, relatively quickly, and be populated across our institution. But, but that's a key way in which we do that. Because you can do these conferences, and that's really important. But to make information more broadly available in the ways that people want to consume that information in the 21st century via social media and otherwise is really an important skill set that we have to internalize and what we have to bring to, to the community. Well, I think that's a, a wonderful way to bring this session to a close. Not that it, we're going to close the session, because I think the ideas that all of you have shared are more provocative in fact, then we could <coughs> respond to in the time we have allowed. But I hope we can invite this team back again to come and talk a little bit more about Haiti as it progresses, because I share with you the idea that we're learning lessons from Haiti and from other countries in the region that have been through disasters or tragedies that can very well help in building a new basis for the economic and social vision that all of us share for the hemisphere. So Julie, thank you for coming. Maite, thank you, thank you for joining us. I was you're going to be back again to elaborate a little bit more on the specifics of a very important project. But thank you, the audience, and I think we should give our guests a hand. <laughs>